Back in 2020, two outrageous things happened. I think you know the first one, but the other one was that this phone was launched at $1,000. Hello everyone, this is Matt from Real World Review, and this is social media. Say hi. And of course, the phone we're talking about today is the Motorola Edge Plus from 2020. Let's get started. This phone goes all out on almost everything, but the main one is the screen. You have flat or curved edge screens, but like the Samsung Note Edge, the Motorola Edge Plus's edges go deep. This ultimately does nothing but looks cool. At first. This technically 6.7 inch flexible OLED display is a 1080p panel with the screen refresh rate locked at 90 Hz with a max brightness of about 500 nits, though it does look plenty bright. It is only 385 pixels per inch, but it still looks pretty amazing. And because of those curved edges, this has a crazy screen to body ratio of about 95% with a very minimal chin and forehead, but they are still there. Speaking of the waterfall curving, you'd be surprised at how well this phone works with edge rejection. Whether you're purposely swiping on the edge or using the screen gestures, it actually works how it's supposed to. I didn't find myself turning the edge screen off because it just worked well. This features an ambient display called the peak display that senses motion to light up the screen and has an underscreen fingerprint scanner that works all right. Not as good as normal optical scanners, but definitely better than ultrasonic ones. This is covered by Gorilla Glass 5, but with a curve like this, you definitely want a screen protector or a decent case on. Curved screens are pointless to me, but this one has a lot of useful features. For one, you can add this little bar to trigger things, like the notification shade or the multitasking. It allows for a cool, weird look when viewing content on the edges, but the best part is when you double click it. So you get this little customizable menu, which has some useful features, rather than just opening up apps. Though this may not be new to you if you've used Samsung devices in the past. But when playing a game, you get this menu. Just like most phones, you get volume control and screen recording, but you get this thing called acoustic lighting, which could be cool and kind of delayed because it does go based on the audio that's playing. But because of the edges, you can program virtual triggers, just like a real gaming phone. And it actually works pretty good. Outside of games, you can make the edges light up when you get a notification, but I ironically didn't see it stand out that much when leaving my phone on a desk. It's stuff like that which can be improved, but it's nice to see a company not only throw a screen like this into a phone, but actually have a point to it. Similar to the screen, the phone is no slouch for hardware options. Now the only downside I can see is lack of proper water resistance, just being splash resistant, which essentially means nothing. Besides that, everything else is 2020 top tier, and still pretty good in 2022. We get the Snapdragon 865 chip with 12 gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of UFS 3.0 storage, though the downside is that it's not expandable. Still, 256 gigabytes standard is pretty good. This chip proves to be the same performance as a Samsung S20 Ultra with an extra 128 gigabytes of storage and a headset jack. Yeah, it has a headset jack. This phone flies through tasks and honestly was wonderful to use. Apps run fine, games run wonderfully, and honestly makes me wonder why people skipped this phone years ago. Sure, $1,000 back then and about $300 now, but the Samsung S20 Ultra was $1,400 with blurry space zoom. To power the chip, we get Android 12, which is kind of a surprise. I'm curious if this is going to be the last major update, but honestly, Android 12 looks pretty amazing on this phone. And it's all powered by that massive 5000 milliamp cell that gives me really good battery life. I wanted to change it when I got this phone, but even after two years, this battery holds up pretty well. I would say two day battery life, which is advertised, is pretty easy to do, and maybe even three days if you're not using heavy apps. To charge this phone, we get a fairly decent 18 watts of wired charging, which was neither fast nor slow. We also get wireless charging up to 15 watts, and even 5 watts of reverse wireless charging. Like the headset jack, I didn't really use that feature that much, but it's still pretty cool to see any phone outside of Samsung have reverse wireless charging. One thing I do have to mention is that the vibrating motor in this phone looks like a worthy contender, but somewhat feels cheap and weak at times. Might be from the size of the motor versus the phone, reminding me of the Samsung S20 Ultra. As for connectivity, this is a 5G phone featuring bands 2, 5, and 66, as well as the ultra-wide bands, though you still get 5G even if you're not on Verizon, like how I get it on T-Mobile. I'm not really sure how that works, though I could have the bands wrong because I wasn't really able to find that information from Motorola. 
You do get Wi-Fi 6 support as well as USB-C 3.1 out of the port on the bottom. While we're at it, let's talk about the outside. Starting with the glass slab on the back with the two holes for the microphone and the aluminum frame in the middle. Like I said, the headset jack is on the top. Under that, we get an earpiece that doubles as a speaker. On the left side, we get nothing, while the right side has the power and volume buttons. On the bottom, we get the SIM tray, another microphone, USB-C port that I was telling you about, and another speaker, giving you a dual speaker setup that sounds pretty good and fairly loud. It's definitely not the best, but it's also not the worst. Because of the screen, this is a pretty tall phone at about 6.34 inches, so think iPhone 13 Pro Max height, with the weight being 1 gram lighter than the iPhone 13 Pro at 203 grams. Because of the size, it doesn't really feel that heavy, but you do notice it after holding the phone for a while. Overall, honestly, one of the most solid phones that I've used, and I'm glad that Motorola didn't make the curved screen the only premium touch of this phone. The last big deal about this phone is the camera. It comes with a large variation of cameras, but the main one is a 108 megapixel f1.8 sensor that features laser autofocus, which the latter looks pretty obvious, but Motorola doesn't really mention it. This also has optical image stabilization, and I honestly never really had issues with the stabilization or focusing when shooting or recording. But there are some weird things. You have to use the 108 megapixel mode or else you get a max of 27 megapixel shots that are binned down. Regardless, shots will come out looking really good and will sometimes have the Motorola look, or at least that's what I'm calling it. Then you get the 3 times telephoto sensor that shoots 8 megapixel shots and is optically stabilized as well. It's an 81 millimeter equivalent and looks pretty good, but you can also tell that the normal camera is a higher quality sensor. Still, nice to have that 3 times reach. The almost last sensor is a 16 megapixel ultrawide sensor that surprisingly focuses, allowing for macro shots to be done with this camera. But make sure to give the sensor some light and be prepared to wait for it to focus. There's also a time of flight sensor here, maybe for focusing or portrait modes, but either way, it's here and not physically usable by the user. Lastly, the video recording options are interesting to say the least. So there is a portrait video similar to the cinematic mode on the iPhone, and it's all right, just like the macro video recording. But for the standard video, we get 1080p, 4K, and even 6K at either 16x9 or 19.5x9 recording ratio. But only 1080p will give you 60 frames per second. With external apps, you can actually shoot 4K at 60 frames per second being the max, but it is strange to see that that feature is missing from the stock app. Still, video doesn't look that bad, and 6K is honestly more useful than 8K video, especially because you get 30 frames per second out of it. For the front camera, it's a fixed focus 25 megapixel camera that can record at a boring 1080p at 30 frames per second max. Honestly, I hate when companies go past that 12 megapixel line on the front camera, especially when they lack an autofocusing unit and 4K recording. Just kind of defeats the purpose of having those extra megapixels. But I'll let you look at the remaining pictures and videos that I took with this phone and let you be the judge. Enjoy. While the camera seems like it should be the main focus of the phone, it's nice that it holds its weight even if it's not the best camera setup overall. Still, this will work for most people and really only lacking a little bit in the video section. There's something about this phone that just works. There's no always on display or double tap to wake, but you can literally pick up the phone, let it scan your face, and now you're in the phone. And if you get a notification, it pops up on the peak display and you can decide what you want to do with that message, all without even unlocking the phone. The edge display feels gimmicky, but can actually be useful, as I've shown you. I like how Motorola brought back the flagship phones, even to this day, with the 2022 version. This phone isn't for everyone, but honestly, I don't know why it wouldn't be. 
For me, when I'm reviewing phones, if I'm dying to get out of one, I quickly switch. But for the last couple of weeks, I've been delighted to use this phone, especially because I'm light on the camera usage. Everything I want to do on this phone just works. And that's my review of the Motorola Edge Plus from 2020, the most edgiest thing from 2020. Okay, that was a dumb tagline, but what do you think about this phone? Should Motorola keep making phones like this? Should people stop being afraid to switch to a non-Apple or Samsung phone? Let me know what you think, and as always, thanks for watching.